All right, well, thanks for sticking around. <laughs> um, we are basically going to keep talking about the same topic uh, that, that Ruben was discussing. Um, so I'm Chip Childers, for those of you that don't know, know me, obviously involved in the CloudStack community, um, but I'm also uh, vice president of product strategy at a uh, startup called Cumulogic. Um, Cumulogic has kind of gone through several lives, um, but right now um, we're, we are very focused uh, on a particular um, part of the, this whole architecture that, that you know, Ruben was talking about. Um, and specifically, that squishy middle layer that sits between infrastructure as a service and PaaS, right, that application developer experience. Um, so we, we think that that's, the middle is actually the hardest part. So what am I gonna do today? Um, we use a term called infrastructure as a service plus. Um, I wanna talk to you a little bit about what that means, some of the general market trends around it, um, examples of how it's actually playing out, why it makes sense um, for us to think about this. Um, and then I, I'll, I'll save my last slide for the end and uh, or save the commercial talk for the end and I, I'll you know, give you a deal. <laughs> All right, so what's Infrastructure as a Service Plus? Um, well, the, the way we think of this is it, it's, it's a platform or a service provider, internal or external, that's providing a combination of IaaS options with all those additional application layer module services. So think RDS, think simple queuing service, simple notification service. These are the Amazon examples, right? Um, they are modular. Uh, they are composable independently. They're consumable independently. And so that's the basic, basic premise. Um, you know, the other way to define it would be to say it's infrastructure as a service plus all the stuff developers actually need uh, to back end their applications, regardless of what their deployment choice is. Foundry, OpenShift, installing it on the VM manually because they haven't heard of config management tools, you know, whatever, whatever their approach might be. So, huh. Oh, well, that was sort of a weird definition, right? So let, let's make sure we're very clear about this. So everybody here knows Amazon, right? All right. Who here has used RDS? Wow, really? Not too many. Excellent. How many people actually deploy applications? Well, that's why. So let me, let me tell you a little bit about what application developers want. What application developers want is they want those, those additional services, right? So that's, that's what Infrastructure as a Service Plus is. Um, so a couple of questions for you. Um, does anybody know which AWS service had the fastest adoption of any new service they introduced after the first five months? No. Any other choices? No. Any other choices? What's that? No. Any other choices? <laughs> However, you're naming you know, really good services. It actually is DynamoDB. Um, DynamoDB, if you don't know what it is, is a, um, it's effectively a NoSQL database, but you can't install it yourself, right? It's, it's delivered entirely as a service, single, single distributed system. Um, document storage, specifically. And very, very, very important to tons of developers out there. And so really, the, the question that I ask myself, I came from a service provider, I think about how you know, private clouds should operate on a regular basis, and the, the, the question that I ask myself is, you know, why is Amazon successful? Why are they driving users into their platform so effectively? It's not, in my opinion, because of EC2, right? EC2 is wonderful, um, but it's just a virtual machine. When you look at, th this is a uh, 451 research um, graph. It's effectively, it's, it's a little fuzzy, sorry, hard, hard to read some of those bits there. Um, but it's a breakdown of you know, where, where are people spending their money in terms of different application types, right, that, um, within cloud infrastructure. Now, one of the things that I found to be really interesting about this was, you know, you can, you could argue that virtual desktop hosting uh, is a very clear, you know, distinct use case. Um, streaming services, obviously. Web serving and, and websites, that's really EC2. Th that's the virtual machine market. Um, storage, file serving, S3, Glacier, right, EBS services. Um, but as you move down, you continue to notice things like database as a service, right? Um, lots of money being spent on RDS or Dynamo, um, 
because they help developers. And you know, why, why do developers care about getting a database in a really abstract way? Anybody have an idea? I mean, it should be fairly obvious, right? They like modularity, right? So they like to be able to say, give me a database, I'll deploy, I'll choose how I deploy my application, but a database is a little bit different, right? The queue broker is a little bit different, potentially. Um, they don't have to worry about the implementation details there, right? The abstraction really does matter. How many of you, you know, well, since you don't do this on a regular basis, the answer is going to be no, but if I had a group of developers here and I asked them how many of you actually like configuring database backups, none of them would raise their hand. And then you could ask a follow-up question, which is, how many of you would bet your job that the last app you deployed, you, you remembered to actually set up a backup schedule for the database, right? The answer, of course, would be nobody. Um, it's because nobody really does this stuff right. And that's why abstraction is so valuable. Yeah, sure. Yes. Yes. Um, and actually, the market's proving that, right? Um, again, Dynamo, incredibly popular. Amazon RDS, incredibly popular. Um, when we look at um, Google, uh, as well as Microsoft, the, their focus in terms of innovation is much more than just, here are the virtual machines, let the developers deal with you know, the specifics of, of databases. Um, all major cloud, public cloud providers today consider database as a service to be a fundamental capability Oh, yeah, correct. Yeah, we're not talking about different types of databases, right? Yeah, no, no, no. And in fact, if you think about the, you know, the various models, right? So let's take RDS versus Dynamo. So with Dynamo, you're writing to the Dynamo API. But with RDS, you're picking your database engine. You just don't care about any of the operational details, right? It, you get to trust the majority of them are taken care of for you. That's, that's the basic premise, right? And then shiny new tech, right? So that's the other reason. If a provider can give you a simple way to just have some fun with a new database in whatever app you're, you know, you're building next, um, this is what developers are going to go do, right? Developers are not going to spend the time to think about how will we run the application in production with this new cool thing that I found that I want to write code against. Um, instead, what they're going to do is they're going to install it on their laptop, write the code, and it works for them. So, you solve this problem, or they get to solve this problem, when they get to consume it as a service, and all the operational considerations are taken care of. Now, I've already been focusing on that. So, commercially, right, so we, I'll explain what a product does at the end, um, but we, we actually are seeing a ton of focus on this data as a service, database as a service um, side of things, which is why I spend you know, so much time thinking about it. Um, market trends, right, 81% Kager is a pretty significant growth from 2012 to 2016. And that's specifically DBAS based on MySQL, right? That's not the whole market. So really what you're talking about there is primarily RDS, um, but a number of, of, of kind of standalone MySQL, you know, public cloud options that are out there. And yeah, but it doesn't actually account for any of the private cloud stuff. Um, that's a bit of a problem. So, so for what, what are folks actually using these services for? Um, this is a you know, question that was posed to um, buyers. And you know, why, why are you going to purchase database as a service? And you know, clearly, as it always is, right, dev and test is, is top of the list, right? That's just because everybody says dev and test first. Um, however, backending web apps, capacity, backup, analytics, you know, all of these are kind of the types of application workloads that you're seeing um, get, get deployed in this way, or get deployed with database backing, uh, as a service backing it. <clears throat> so, what does this mean to you? How many people here are, work for a service provider? Cool. How many people here work for an enterprise that uses CloudSack? Okay, great, great. Yeah, so, and some are both, right? Um, so, so this, this general trend of these composable services actually has a really big impact both on providers as well as um, the enterprise, private clouds. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of walk through some of those. So for service providers, 
Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, at least in North America, with some other names uh, in, in other uh, major markets around the globe, have decided that there's effectively a new bar for public cloud services. So if you're a smaller provider, you're going to have to get into this space, right? You have to get in the space because every developer that's going to go and look for cloud services is going to demand an RDS-style capability. They're getting it from all the big players. Well, obviously, if you do it, then you're going to increase consumption, right? Because you're going to actually attract those developers. But if you don't do it, you are going to find yourself in a shrinking market because when expectations get raised by the, the market set, um, you know, trend setters, those expectations are held to, and your buyers are going to have them of you. So that should be all kind of obvious, right? All right, now for the, the enterprise guys. Now you're thinking, well, this is all kind of market conversation. Who cares? You know, how does it relate to me? Um, for the enterprise private clouds, um, the guys that have them, who, who are you primarily servicing? Uh, it, any of you could answer. You, you raised your hand. Are you servicing application development teams or uh, you know, what, what type of so groups? I have a combination. I have an mm -hmm. Got it. That, that makes perfect sense, right? Um, anybody else care to share if you raised your hand? CRM and quoting software. Okay. In interesting. That's normally not the type of workload you see put on a. Got it. All right. All right. There you go. Good Citrix guy. So actually, I, so I've been talking to a lot of enterprises, right? And one of the one of the bigger challenges um, that people who have invested a lot of time in building a private cloud, time and capital, frankly is that you know, they, what they wanted to do was establish an environment that was going to provide the same type of agility that their line of business or shadow IT developers, whatever you want to call them, right, um, that their, their application teams were getting out on the public cloud. And for whatever reason, they wanted to bring it in-house, right? There, there could be cost reasons, right? And I'm not getting into the whole private versus public cost debate, um, but some people want to bring that type of activity back into their house. Um, this, the IT shop wants to reinvent itself to be a service provider to, to its uh, constituents, right? That's the other common theme. Um, what, what I've personally found is that there are some very successful private clouds, but they never actually seem to be successful if all they're offering are virtual machines to their, their developers, right? We're seeing it, um, you know, primarily you have to tie in some type of application pipeline process, um, or you need to... Uh, you know, be using a PaaS, or you need to have some big catalog of services, right? That's re what really makes a private cloud successful um, if your goal is to bring, bring those devs in. So give, give us an example of that. There, yeah. There, there are service providers who are successful not doing just VMs. Who are Service providers who are successful doing not just virtual machines? Not just virtual machines. Okay, Amazon. They're, they're the, the you know, they're set in the market, right? Amazon's the 800 pound gorilla. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, fair enough. <laughs> okay, so fair enough. Let me, let me clarify. Yeah, Rackspace. So maybe Microsoft? Rackspace. Well, we can get into whether uh, Google and Microsoft are currently, you know, adopted enough to be market leaders, but yeah, Salesforce. Google and Microsoft are. I wouldn't go to Salesforce because you're actually at a different level of abstraction there, right? Are you talking Heroku or Salesforce.com? Oh, can you be successful without a vir virtual machine you, business you model? Can you enter this market and, and, and as a service provider and say, I'm going to avoid the infrastructure altogether? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I guess it depends on how you're going to actually provide your services and you know, what your differentiation is going to be. I mean, are you, thinking, are, you, are you saying go use Amazon's infrastructure but look like a service provider who just does a bunch of other stuff? That, that's true, yeah. Yeah, so, so the impression is that Amazon's success is EC2. So my premise is that that is not the case. And there's actually um, both providers and internal enterprise, uh, you're, you're missing the point. Why are developers going to Amazon? It's because of all the other capabilities that they've bundled together, right? 
Certainly, EC2 is used significantly, right? And it's a great resource. It's, it, that's effectively the utility out of the Amazon cloud, right? But the RDS functionality isn't really as, as much of a utility at this point, right? It's, it's actually a higher value service. Of course, you can keep moving up the stack. You can get to, into things like Redshift. You can get into things like you know, simple notification service. Um, certainly, the goal is to fully commoditize that type of functionality. Um, but then you get into Amazon OpsWorks or Elastic Beanstalk, you know, where we can, we can debate whether that's successful or not, right? But um, they, they give a whole bunch of options for developers to choose how they want to consume what is really the same underlying infrastructure, right? Make sense? All right. So within the enterprise private cloud, <clears throat> I mentioned this, right? Uh, it, there, there's a, there is a trend where just virtual machine-based private clouds are not nearly as successful as they need to be inside the enterprise. Um, I'm, I'm seeing it as I talk to companies. Um, there's another obvious reason, right? This is why, why would I use something that would automate a bunch of tasks for me in a particular, you know, back-end domain? Um, you know, pro probably because it reduces risks, cost, gives you more capacity in your team. It's just, like, you know, the smart thing to do. And you get architectural choice. So including the potential for AWS repatriation. Um, anybody believe that that's a trend? Repatriation would be you've put everything out there on Amazon, you now bring it back in-house. Yeah? But you can't check out. Yeah. yeah. It is, it is. And there's, so there's a couple of reasons why you can't check out. Um, there's data gravity. Who, who here knows what data gravity as a concept is? Yeah, all right. The basic premise of data gravity, and I'm, I'm going to probably butcher the, the actual definition um, uh, that uh, has, has been put out there, but basic premise of data gravity is that <clears throat> applications and services are going to naturally gravitate towards the location of the data. So what does that really mean? If a cloud provider has the data, you're going to run your application in that cloud provider, right? That seems kind of logical. So you're going to start building more and more data. You're going to start building more, more and more applications in the environment. So that, that is a huge part of why it's difficult for somebody to get out of the provider that they've bought into, Amazon specifically. Um, but again, the other reason is that you probably built your application and your staffing models around the theory that things like queuing servers are really easy. They're a couple of clicks, and you don't have to manage them. You just use them from the applications. Um, so the lack of these types of modular services in a private cloud make that private cloud an unattractive target as you try to move all of your applications back into the environment. Is this making sense? Yeah? Possibly. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let me pause for a second. Let me talk about how I think that the, this relates to, to a PaaS model for application teams. Um, I'm going to use Cloud Foundry as the example. So who here is familiar with Cloud Foundry? A couple. All right. Besides hearing the name, do you actually understand the, the constructs behind it? OK. So Cloud Foundry, as a developer, what's my experience? Well, I write some code. And my code is the application. Um, I then take that application and push it into Cloud Foundry. Now, typically, not all the time, but typically, you need a database or a backend thing, right? And that's pretty important for applications to persist their data. And so what you're going to do is you're going to instantiate backend services using the Cloud Foundry CLI tool. You're then going to bind them to an application. And when the app spins up, it'll have access to that database. So the, the way that, that I see the kind of the bottom-up infrastructure, you then build a little bit more of abstraction above that with automation and capabilities. Um, you know, that, that, that model, tying into the Cloud Foundry approach, is that actually Cloud Foundry doesn't have a lot of production-grade back-end services that, that it implements, right? Um, it, and the, the strategy that the Pivotal folks have taken is to create this notion of a service broker. And then they rely on an ecosystem to build all the back-end services that developers are going to use. 
So as infrastructure as a service cloud start building up, if you're, if you're layering Cloud Foundry on top in an enterprise, let's say, you know, you, maybe you want databases. Well, you, know, you might want a little bit more capability besides just instantiated database. You might want it to be backed up. You might want it to be monitored, right? So that's where kind of this infrastructure up set of functionality is going to help and provide the foundational back-end services that Cloud Foundry consumers can make use of. So that, that's how I see those interrelating. Did that make sense? Yes, no? Right. All right. Fair enough. Good. So I'm going to just do a, just a little commercial thing here. So we're at an open source conference, but, you know, day job paid for me to come. <laughs> What's that? But it's, it's okay, though, because I, I have a picture of beer and a pretzel, so it's okay, right? <laughs> All right. So here, here's a short pitch. Um, Cumulogic is actually offering uh, a platform that will allow the, this, this middle layer of services, right? Um, we, are, we are working with Cloud Foundry in that example to be some of those middle services. Um, we are working with service providers to add RDS capabilities to their infrastructures and service platforms. So that's what we're doing. Um, and so uh, you can read the fine print there that they actually wanted me to explain to you. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted to show the picture of beer. Um, yeah, so we're, if anybody's interested, love to talk to you. Um, we are running a little bit of a deal. Um, we're discounting our proof of concept fees pretty significantly for the next month. And uh, we would be happy to explain you know, how we work great with Cloud Platform and Cloud Stack. So also with Amazon, also with other, uh, other environments. So with that, I'm done pitching you. I appreciate it. Any questions, discussion? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question that I don't have an answer for right now. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, actually, no. A fair. A fair here, here's a fair uh, assessment to that, right? So when you're building a business, the first thing you need to do is focus on getting um, customers. Once you have a product, and so we're focused on that right now. What's that? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other questions on this whole concept? Did I completely confuse people? So, so Feedback? I actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a simple way to do it. Private database as a service. So, yeah, fair question. Well, we actually offer all of those services. I mean, Samir, of course, thanks for the, uh, the line, right? Samir is one of our investors. Um, <laughs> that's why we brought him, right? Yeah, we actually do offer all of those services. Um, the, the reason why I focused on database as a service, honestly, is that that is what the majority of our customers want from us, right? Um, both in terms of providers as well as enterprises. Um, they're pleasantly surprised when they find out they can also get queuing capabilities, cache capabilities, e you know, ELB capabilities, um, as well as some application composition options um, that look like Beanstalk, right? Um, but, but we are very much focused on database as a service right now. Um, it, it's, it's largely the RDS-style experience that people want. Yep. yep. That, that seems to be the preferred model. Um, go, go back to the whole data gravity problem. Dynamo's issue uh, is, is that it is the only implementation of Dynamo. And Well, you could, but that might be your next startup. <laughs> yeah, we could. Um, but actually, what we're really finding is that the, the experience of being able to kind of select a known engine, right, um, whether it's NoSQL or whether it's relational, um, is a real positive experience for the, the application developers that are, that are trying our platform. They love it because, you know, they, they know these tools already. It's not a new API. They don't have to go find some new JDBC driver to make it work. Um, so it's, you know, I get to pick MySQL. I get to pick Oracle. Um, and it's, again, the operations are handled for you. Yep. All right, well, with that, thanks for coming.
Appreciate it. <laughs>